Okay, so one thing I hope to convey here is, is the certain divide that exists within the literature concerning the Schwartz Lemma and that this divide should be noticed and in fact what has led to the recent developments is making use of the the third aspect of this division uh, which has been long neglected or has been believed to be superseded by further developments. So this first part we'll be talking about the pick Schwartz Lemma. As it stands, just to remind ourselves, the Schwartz Lemma controls the growth, or maybe a better word would be distortion, of holomorphic functions. So it says that they can't grow too much. You know, if I have a holomorphic map from the disk of radius R1 to the disk of radius R2, and it fixes the origin, then the disk in the image that it's mapped to cannot be larger in radius than the ratio of the image disk divided by the ratio of the source disk. Now, it was observed, now this is an old theorem, you know, this is shortly after Riemann's attempt at the proof of the Riemann mapping theorem, and which was around the mid, mid uh, 19th century. And it was observed by Pick in 1916 that the Schwartz lemma could be given a radically different interpretation. The first thing to observe that was observed by Pick was the and the assumption that f of zero sends to f of zero is zero itself, so it maps it fixes the origin, was actually unnecessary to assume. Suppose that f maps the origin to some non-zero point in the disk. Then what we can do is we can use a Mobius transformation, which is given here, or a fractional linear transformation, to essentially put that image back. So if I have a point alpha in the unit disk, I can map it back to the origin exactly by this map. So now I can use the homogeneous structure of the disk to construct a holomorphic self map of the unit disk, which fixes the origin. Namely, I send F to the disk, which sends the point zero to the point alpha. And then I use the fractional linear transformation or the Mobius transformation to send alpha back to the origin and then consider the composition. Now, if I apply the familiar Schwartz lemma in this case, what I end up with is the following inequality. Noting here that f of, uh, I've, I've been a little more general here. I've, I've said that it um, maps w to f of w instead of assuming that f of, f of zero is, is zero. So now we can define this function, this, uh, this function that appears on the, on the right-hand side of that inequality. We'll call this the pseudo-hyperbolic distance, and that's a reasonable name because this does indeed define a distance function. Namely, it's a symmetric non-degenerate function and satisfies the triangle inequality. But in a sense that will be made clear in further developments and is, um, is important in, in the sense that Pick did not give his theorem in terms of the pseudo-hyperbolic distance. We want, a, we want another distance function. We're going to want a distance function that comes from integrating a Ramanian metric. So this one does not come from an infinitesimal structure. It, it comes from exactly this formula here. There's nothing intrinsic or, or infinitesimal about it, I should say. So how do you get a metric from integrating a, or how do you get a distance function from integrating a Ramanian metric? Well. We know how to do this in, in the case of curves. You know, if we take a curve and I, I look at all the tangent vectors, what I then do is I, I look at, I, I zoom in and I take the, you know, this uh, triangle here, uh, this infinitesimal triangle, and I add them up. That will give me essentially what I've done is I've added up all the tangent vectors to this curve, and that tells me the arc length. So the distance between any two points in the curve is exactly given by this integral expression here. Now, if we're on a manifold, then we can definitely do the same thing because uh, a Riemannian metric is a symmetric non-degenerate bilinear form on each of these tangent spaces. So we have an inner product on each of these tangent spaces. And what we can then do is, as the curve is moving along the manifold, we have a tangent vector along each point, supposing it's a, it's a smooth curve, and then we can basically calculate the norm 
of each of these tangent vectors at each of these tangents in each of these tangent spaces using the Riemannian metric and then add them up as we integrate along the manifold. So that will give us a distance function if we have one, if we have an inner product in each of these tangent spaces which varies smoothly. So one instance of a, a Riemannian metric on the disk which is, which is uh, very natural to consider is the, the Poincaré metric. So the Poincaré metric is given by the, the arc length element uh, which you can think of a dz tensor dz, or more precisely dz tensor dz bar, divided by 1 minus mod z squared all squared. Now, just to get some intuition for how the, the geometry changes when we endow the, the disk with the Poincaré metric as opposed to the Euclidean uh, metric, let us compute the length of a line segment which connects the origin to some real number w which is between 0 and 1. So what we see is that if we we can parameterize the curve gap, uh, this, this arc length element or this line element, by a curve gamma, and gamma will of course just be defined by t times w, then the length of this is just given by integrating over L of exactly the Riemannian metric element. Now what we see from the formula for rho is that we'll end up with w over 1 minus w squared t squared. And then we can express that by rearranging appropriately as the integral from 0 to w of dt divided by 1 minus t squared. And then elementary calculus will then tell you that this is exactly one half of the logarithm of 1 plus w over 1 minus w. Now from here we, we can consider a, an associated distance function, namely the distance with respect to this, you can show that the distance function for the Poincaré metric is given by one half of the logarithm of the modulus of this fractional linear transformation. Now, now what do we see here? What, what we see is that the shortest length between these curves is going to be given, so that the thing that minimizes the length functional, at least locally, will be given by arcs which emanate from the boundary of, of the disk, so they will take an infinite amount of time to, to get to the boundary of the disk, in particular it's a complete metric, we'll have these, these arcs which are orthogonal to the boundary of the disk, and those paths are the ones that are the shortest distance with respect to the Poincaré metric. So in fact the geometry is, is very different, it's a, it's a very, um, very different to Euclidean geometry here we have a tendency to diverge as opposed to remain parallel, for instance. So if we summarize this discussion, what we've essentially done is recovered the following theorem of Pick, which is referred to as the pick schwartz lemma. Namely, that if we take a holomorphic map from the unit disk to itself, I'm, I'm just gonna assume the radius is one, which does not necessarily fix the origin this time, then the inequality we proved before using the fractional linear transformations says that the distance function with respect to the Poincaré metric decreases under holomorphic maps. So all holomorphic maps are distance decreasing with respect to the Poincaré metric. Now, this has some important consequences because what we see now is that the content of the schwartz lemma is not actually about holomorphic maps, it's about the distance function, it's about the distance function associated to the Poincaré metric. So that's, that's the sense in which we want to um, think of this as a, as a second, as a, as a rift, as a divergence in the development.